Major parties fail Australia again, and Anglo-Americans make their worst nightmare come true. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 11th of February 2022. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party leader, Craig Ishwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. On today's we're going to be discussing uh, the results of two parliamentary inquiries on sterling first and manufacturing. And we'll also discuss the latest on the war danger and efforts to defuse it. Uh, before we get into it, don't forget, if you like today's show, hit the thumbs up button. That'll get it out more widely. Uh, don't forget, you can subscribe to be alerted of new shows and hit the notification bell. And to generally share this as widely as possible to get these ideas out and about. Um, so um, before we get into today's first topic, and uh, I'm joining you remotely today from isolation because uh, uh, the men of the household have brought... <laughs> Omicron into yeah. our environment. So <laughs> please excuse the different format. Um, and Craig, you might want to say something just briefly too about our campaign launch for the 2022 election, which took place last night. Uh, and yeah. I just love the fact that you can, uh, if you weren't watching that last night, uh, you can go to our website, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel and you can watch the full proceedings, which went for, I think, about two and a half hours. Um, but meet all of our candidates. Uh, and also we have our web pages up now on all of our candidates. If you go to our website, you'll see all of that, including the full fighting platform for this election. Yeah, I think Lisa, it was a very successful launch. I mean, it's a very different launch. Uh, it's a virtual launch for us, which is, is the first time we've done a live streaming event, but it was very successful. And our candidates all had a chance to speak. So if people want to know who our candidates are, and we are, uh, you know, fielding slates in Western Australia and Northern Territory, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. We're not fielding a slate, unfortunately, in Tasmania because we haven't been able to get down there with all the COVID restrictions and lockouts and stuff and, and, and build, for, build for this election. But it was a very, very exciting night. Our candidates had a lot to say and it went for about two and a half hours. So people can tune in to our website to watch that event. It's, it's archived there uh, or on YouTube whatever they choose, but uh, it, we lay out what we're standing, our, our fighting platform for this election, the 15 points, and we talk about the, the crucial elements of what we're fighting for, starting with a postal bank. That's the most important issue for us, to, to, for, for rural communities, for the country as a whole. We talk about national banking, development banks, infrastructure bank, and you know, the, the, the whole platform, our whole fighting platform is built around the concept of physical economic development. Physical economics is not the same as the money, monetary driven economics we've got and had for the last 40 years. Physical economics means you actually fund through credit, through a national bank, the real development of the economy through infrastructure development by properly funding healthcare and other aspects of infrastructure that we need to support our population. It's a completely different paradigm compared to what we've had for the last 40 years. And uh, you know, this particular election, we have to say goodbye to Scott Morrison and all the rubbish he's brought to this period, you know, the attacks on Christine Holgate. This guy doesn't deserve to be in there and we uh, will play our part to get rid of him. Not to say that the opposition Labor Party is any better at this stage. We're going to have to, as the Citizens Party and as the viewers of this program, have participated in our various campaigns over the last, you know, last four years in particular, it comes down to what the citizens of our, of our country do in keeping our politicians on track, letting them know what they want. And the more that happens, the better government we get. So that's this, we kicked off our campaign launch with that message in mind, with the fighting platform. So very exciting. People should jump on the website, have a look. And if people want to get involved, please let us know. Uh, because it's very important that we have as many people as possible participating in in this election campaign as far as for as much as we can actually do mm -hmm. and you'll see links below of how you can contact us uh, and get more further involved um, now that brings us to us for our first topic which is major parties fail australia again and 
just to um, comment on what you just said, Craig, because one of the things that struck me last night was from a number of our candidates, the expression of uh, the fact that, you know, we're not pledging to get elected and solve everything for people making some grand promises. We're asking people to get engaged in politics because together we can change the system, the entire particularly economic framework, which is currently collapsing. And uh, we, the success we've had in engaging people in numerous campaigns over the last couple of years, some of the details of which you ran through last night, has been rather extraordinary. And today we want to report on two inquiries, the Sterling First Inquiry and broader inquiry into ASIC's failings, uh, and also the manufacturing inquiry, both of which took place last year. Uh, and these are classic examples, as you'll see as we go through, of the intervention that ordinary citizens can make to bring crucial issues to the attention of our parliamentarians who cannot ignore it when we do it in this way. Um, so firstly, on the Sterling First Inquiry report on last week's show um, on the Friday, that report had not yet come out. It came out after we did the show. Um, so we'll run through some of the findings. Um, the main report that the committee uh, ran with was not great. It did do a number of things. It called for uh, necessary action to support investors. It called for access to the compensation scheme of last resort for the victims of Sterling First, who were, of course, um, uh, they got into a what they thought was a rent for life scheme where they were just paying their rent up front, but it turned out to be a convoluted managed investment scheme, which are excluded from the CSLR. Um, and the report did in fact call for an expansion of that CSLR to include managed investment schemes, which is good as far as that goes. Uh, the report called for support to be made available uh, for appropriate and affordable housing for the Sterling First victims. And it called for ASIC to pursue legal proceedings where appropriate uh, and consideration of various other reviews and changes, which were fairly wishy-washy. What it did not do was to condemn ASIC for its failings that we've pointed out in Living Colour or the philosophy of the regulatory framework in which ASIC operates, which is the every man for himself or caveat Emptor philosophy. One other important admission um, that was made in the main report, uh, they stated that the committee believes that ASIC had sufficient evidence and grounds for concern in 2017 to refer the matter to its enforcement division for investigation. And it also pointed to possible contraventions of the Corporations Act 2001 but it doesn't take that any further in terms of demanding action to reform ASIC or for calling for immediate compensation for the victims. Um, but I'll get to that in the moment because there, there are a couple of other sections of this report. One is there's a Liberal Party dissenting report. Um, so as usual, the, the neoliberals, the, the most neoliberal of the neoliberals have to put out a dissenting report um, uh, objecting to even those weak demands. Um, and it's it's made worse by the fact that Liberal Senator Paul Scar actually did an excellent job running the inquiry, and yet he puts his name to this dissenting report, uh, which disagrees with things like the expansion of the CSLR, uh, the compensation scheme. It What it generally does is it sheets blame to the government department in Western Australia that, you know, this was not a Commonwealth matter uh, this really should have been um, dealt with by the Western Australian Department that was overseeing all of this. So it's just a deflection from any blame for the federal government. One thing that the uh, Liberal Party dissenting report did, however, reveal in the course of doing that was that tenants had the continuing right of occupancy in their homes if the Sterling First Income Trust didn't meet, was not able to meet their rental payments, which is what happened. But for the fact that Western Australia's Residential Tenancies Act, the act itself voided that continuing right of occupancy. And why that clash was not identified by the Western Australian Government Department is a matter that they demand be investigated. 
So that was one interesting aspect of that descending report. But the best part of the report was the additional comments submitted by Malcolm Roberts, the Senator for One Nation, and that was very good. This is what he said, uh, among other things. He said, all factors considered, including ASIC's regulatory negligence and the advanced age and vulnerability of the Sterling and Silverlink ten tenant victims who are being evicted, the Commonwealth Government, which is responsible for ASIC and its regulatory philosophy, should immediately compensate the 130 victims for the full $18.5 million they lost, plus interest and expenses. Um, and he laid out a lot of the details of the case, uh, just as we've laid out on this show many times, um, damning uh, ASIC and the government philosophy that oversees ASIC for the fact that this was allowed to happen. Now, in a press release, just to add to Robert's comments, in a press release we put out this week, uh, what we're calling for is the Commonwealth Government must make an immediate act of grace payment, uh, which would save um, the Sterling victims, who many of whom are homeless, about to be homeless, facing um, you know, health issues and so forth. What this, this does not require an admission of responsibility on behalf of the government or ASIC. They can make this act of grace payment regardless of that. Um, but of course, we're also for the longer term fight demanding that ASIC is completely overhauled and turned into a strong and effective regulator feared by financial predators. That's what needs to happen. Yeah, time and time again, Lisa, I think it, this whole process points to the, the valuable role of minor parties in the committee processes because if people go and review what we've been able to do in, in, in calling for at six inquiries since uh, 2017 is that the, the minor parties have played a crucial role in, in shining a spotlight on issues the government doesn't want to raise or even the Labor Party doesn't want to raise. They ask the hard questions and they put the government on notice. And a very important role for people to realise if, they, if they're looking towards the next election vote for the minor parties because that way you're giving power to the minor parties to do exactly what they've seen what, what you've seen happening and, uh, and this, uh, this this call by Senator Roberts is spot on the mark there's an incredible injustice here from a very weak regulator that has to be strengthened and the only way that that can happen is again the voice of the people jump up and down about it and you know support minor parties move away from the major parties as much as you can yeah, unless in the certain cases where we've had certain collaborators that you would have heard about in the Labor and Liberal parties and Greens parties where, you know, there's certain MPs that have played a really important role. Um, so it's a case-by-case -case, uh, matter for each electorate to do your research and find out um, who is supporting this and call them up, you know, call up all the MPs, all the candidates in your area and find out where they stand on some of these crucial issues and particularly like those that you mentioned earlier, Craig, such as our major platform um, issues of postal bank and so forth. Yeah, Alyssa, can I just jump in here? Just, I want to remind people that, you know, politicians are very busy and they're not automatically going to pick up issues unless there's a lot of people contacting them and jumping up and down. It's just like you or me, we get so busy that things get forgotten or you don't focus on things until it's brought to your attention. If it's important to you, make sure it's important to the politicians, the members of parliament, your own local representative. Otherwise, quite often, just through sheer busyness, and it's not always the case, but just through sheer businesses, they don't pick it up. Yeah. Um, now, the manufacturing inquiry report also shows in spades how this process is very, very effective. And it, in fact, references the Australian Citizen, Citizens Party quite a lot in the final report. And remember, this um, inquiry was called by Labor Senator Kimberly Kitching, who knows us very well, doesn't necessarily like us very well, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but um, yeah, the, it's a similar to the Sterling First Report in a number of ways because the, the, it's a Labor majority committee and their report was, you know, there was some good elements to it, but it was pretty weak. There was a Liberal dissenting report as well, as we saw similarly with Sterling First. Um, and it cited us. There was no Senator Roberts in the mix like the uh, Sterling First one, but the citation of us was significant enough to form what could be considered as a dissenting report within the um, majority report, I guess you could say. Um, so the, the majority report of the Labor um, 
senators on this inquiry into the state of Australian manufacturing is similar to what Anthony Albanese has been campaigning on. I mean, they call for things like a manufacturing fund. Um, you know, again, these things are all fairly weak. We're going to be reviewing the ALP policy on manufacturing because um, they make some pretty grand claims, but so far what we've looked into doesn't match up to that. In fact, in our initial estimates, this is a non-plan, a non-manufacturing plan, which will continue the deindustrialization of this country. Um, now, the Liberal Party's dissenting report uh, is a neoliberal supercharged report. I just want to read one quote from it. It says, the majority report proposes a number of recommendations which would underpin a government-driven interventionist approach in the manufacturing sector. Such policies have not worked in the past and there is no evidence to suggest that they will work in the future. The danger is that they will distort the market and cause more harm than good. Now, the report barely does that. Uh, we are the ones that are really calling for the internet interventionist uh, approach, which of course has worked in our past, as we saw, you know, during the war years and so forth. Um, but the Labor Party, uh, sorry, the Liberal Party in their dissenting report even oppose using channeling superannuation funds, for instance, into manufacturing. Even that's too much of an interventionist approach. In the overall report, there's only one mention of a national bank solution. I mean, this is crucial because what we've said and what other experts that uh, testified to the committee have made very, very clear is that investment is the key ingredient that is lacking. Um, so it, th this is the reference to it though. The Australian Citizens Party and National Civic Council called for more government investment, recommending a national government-backed development bank, such as those used in Norway, Germany, China and Japan, and not dissimilar to existing entities such as the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation or the original Commonwealth Bank. So the one reference to uh, national banking and that kind of level of injection of credit and investment is literally just citing us. Lisa, the, the issue here is that you can see the ideological uh, battle lines drawn in these reports because what the Liberal Party is saying is that nothing except comparative advantage is going to work. We're only good for, for mining and you know, essentially digging minerals out of the ground and, uh, as Paul Keating would call for, become the financial centre of the South. Anything else is irrelevant, like manufacturing is irrelevant. You're not supposed to develop a manufacturing industry. Right, you're not supposed to have uh, the ability to produce your own goods. But look, look at the old Labor Party. Right, go back to Curtin and Chifley. They used the Commonwealth Bank in the war years to develop a massive increase in manufacturing so we could defend ourselves. So the model is there in our own history that if you have government-directed credit right, into vital industries, and that's manufacturing, you only have to look at the problem with rat tests in this country right now, and the previously that was the masks. Right, that, that highlighted... This, this, this ideological uh, policy of the Liberals in order to promote free trade policies. And free trade, you know, what the comparative advantage is just one aspect of that free trade. So it's, it, as you say, our, the reference to what we're talking about is uh, an attack on that ideological framework. We're saying, no, government has a, ro a right, a necessity to support through a government bank backed development bank the ability to provide credit, and it's not alone. Other countries do this, right? So this is where the Morrison government has failed the Australian economy in so many respects, not just the Morrison government, every Liberal Party government before this, on ideological ground, has failed to support the development of our country at the level of manufacturing and other, and other sectors in agriculture as well because of this ideological fight. So that's where the battle lines are drawn in these reports. And you just see it coming out in, in, in this Sterling First report, you see it coming out in the manufacturing report. Every single thing this government do, does, including go back to the Australia Post inquiry, everything is drawn on these ideological lines. People come last with this government. Yeah, and speaking of those battle lines, this is a perfect illustration. I want to read the bit where, they, where the report references the Australian Citizens Party more extensively has a bit of a dig at us and what we're doing by mobilising the citizenry to get involved. So I just want to read that out. 
this this is probably the best section of the report, honestly. Um, it says, while 130 submissions, which is what they received, is a reasonably large number for an inquiry, approximately two thirds of those submissions were made by members or supporters of the Australian Citizens Party. Yay! Yay. <laughs> the ACP frequently conducts mass campaigns on economic issues such as banking, currency regulations and manufacturing. They are disposed to focus on policies that were implemented in the 1950s and 1960s. And they tend to advocate, regardless of the specific issue, for the same suite of measures, including the establishment of a national development or postal bank, instituting Glass-Steagall banking regulations, building the Bradfield scheme to pump water from Queensland to New South Wales and Victoria, and a return to tariff protection. The ACP itself also provided a submission which mirrored those themes, but also included additional modern themes, such as thorium, nuclear reactors, and nanotechnology. But I want to add before, before you comment that later the report goes on to acknowledge that the 50s, 1950s and 60s was the peak of Australian manufacturing. It says, as a proportion of gross domestic product, manufacturing has fallen from almost 30% in the 1950s and 60s to below 6% in 2019, considerably lower than other OECD countries and the OECD average. It also says a bit later as well that the committee notes how the Australian manufacturing sector has declined since the liberalising economic reforms of the 1980s and 1990s. In 1990, manufacturing stood at just under 14% of the economy, which had more than halved to 5.6% of the economy by 2020. Mm. So they undercut their own argument that we're harking back to the days of old, which wouldn't work by admitting that that was the height of our manufacturing capacity. Yeah, well, Lisa, we live in Coburg. And there used to be tonnes of manufacturing around here, which is mostly all gone. And the real change started in the early 1980s, 1983, when the Hawke-Keating government came to power. First of all, they floated the Australian dollar, which made the, our, our dollar into a commodity and you know, speculative markets kicked in and so forth. And then secondly, they started in decreasing tariffs. The point is, this is the Labor Party that did this. This wasn't the Liberal Party, this is the Labor Party. And it was um, such a sensitive issue that Bob Hawke used to be the member of this electorate, right? And we had a huge manufacturing plant called Kodak Eastman down the road here. And the, the US, because of the tariffs, because of the changes in trading conditions, Kodak Eastman in the United States said, oh, we're going to shut the Coburg plant down. What happened? is Bob Hawke gave them a $60 million lifeline to try and keep them open because it wouldn't look too good losing four to 500 jobs in this electorate for the Prime Minister. So he did. He bribed them basically to stay. And anyway, Kodak ended up shutting down in 2004 anyway. Uh, but that's the nature of, of, of the, uh, the ideological fight, even within the Labor Party. I mean, they, they brought in the, uh, you know, the... the, the the, uh, the floating exchange rate system, floated our dollar, they brought in the tariff cuts and continued, you know, the Liberal Party said, oh, thanks very much, Labor Party, we'll just continue what you're doing, right? Now, we're saying go back to the policies of Curtin and Chifley, go back to the idea of funding manufacture. Yeah, 50s and 60s was the peak of our manufacturing. Why? Is because in the 40s, in the war years, you had this massive injection of credit into the physical economy in order to fight the war, which then lasted for decade, for about a decade and a half afterwards as this policy was continued. Uh, Menzies didn't shut it down. He, you know, he, uh, he just went along with it because he was getting the benefit of the policy decisions that were made by an old Labor, uh, Labor government. Now, that Labor government doesn't exist. Um, Albanese could learn a lot from that, but let's see what happens. Sometimes they refer to these greats, the Curtin and the Chifleys, but that doesn't usually translate into policy. But we've got the policies, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah. now, um, another area where Labor and Liberal are failing us is the war front. So we want to turn to our second topic now. Anglo-Americans make their worst nightmare come true. Um, so, of course, we're referring to Australia's uh, dangerous Anglo-American allies as former Prime Minister Malcolm 
phrase I used to refer to. And Australia is continuing to play into the ongoing drumbeat, which is getting deafening for war. And of course, the latest ruse for war being the claims, uh, the lies that Russia is intending to invade Ukraine, which there's uh, no basis for whatsoever. Um, so just a couple of updates from the last week. Um, uh, this, a spokesman for the State Department, Ned Price, made an extraordinary press conference the other day, and we'll show a clip from this, um, where he alleged without, any, without showing any evidence that Russia is uh, preparing a fake video which they will release showing graphic scenes in Ukraine that would justify a Russian invasion. Um, now, I want to show this clip of a um, veteran AP journalist uh, quizzing Ned Price on this, which he did an excellent job because usually this sort of stuff just gets let fly, um, where you can see um, the journalist pressing him for the actual, when are you going to present the actual evidence? And he keeps saying, I just did it. He stated that they had it, but he didn't actually present anything. So I think this is really indicative of how this thing works. And of course, bear in mind the WMD and all the other lies that we've had for the previous uh, series of regime change wars, which we do not want to be repeated. So we'll just run that clip. Uh, thanks. Uh, okay, well, that's a, quite a mouthful there. Um, so you said actions such as these suggest otherwise, suggest meaning they, they suggest they're not interested in talks and they're going to go ahead with some kind of a... What action are you talking about? One, the actions I've just pointed to. Uh, the what fact, action? What? The, the fact that Russia continues to engage uh, in disinformation well, uh, campaigns. You, know, you made an allegation that they might do that. Have they actually done it? Uh, what we know, Matt, is what we what I have just said that they have engaged in this activity, well, uh, in this planning well, activity. Like, but, but let me let me because because obviously this is not this is not the first time we've made uh, these reports public. You'll remember that just a few well, weeks I, ago. I'm sorry, you, made, made, made what report public? If you let me finish, I will okay. tell you what report we made okay. public. Uh, we told you a few weeks ago that we have information indicating Russia also has already prepositioned a group of operatives to conduct a false flag operation in eastern Ukraine. So that, Matt, to your question, is an action that Russia has well, already taken. It's an action that you say that they have taken, but you have shown no evidence to, 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 to confirm that. And I'm going to get to the next question here, which is, what is the evidence that they, I mean, this is like crisis actors, really? This is like Alex Jones territory you're getting into now. Um, what evidence do you have to support the idea that there is some propaganda film in the in in the making? Matt, this is derived uh, from information known to the U.S. government, intelligence information that we have declassified. I think you well, know. Okay, well, where where is it? Where where is this information? It is intelligence information that we have declassified. Well, where is it? Where is the declassified information? I just delivered it. But, no, you made a series of allegations and would statements. You, would you like us to print it out the topper? Because you will see a transcript of this briefing that you can print out for that, yourself. That's not evidence, Ned. That's you saying it. That's not evidence. I'm sorry. <laughs> what would you like, Matt? I, I would like to see some proof that you that 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 that, that, that you can show that that. Matt, you have that, been that, that shows you, that 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 you, shows that the Russians are doing this. Ned, I've been doing this for. A I long know that time. was my point. As, you as, you as have you, know. you you have been doing this for quite a while. You know I that have. when we declassify intelligence That's information, right. and I we do so in, in a means. In we do and so. I, and, we do so and with an eye to that, protecting that sources and methods. Is not going to fall. I, I remember a lot of things. So where, where where is the declassified information other than you coming out here and saying? Matt, I'm sorry you don't like the format, uh, but we have declassified. It's not the format; it's the content. I'm it's sorry you don't like the content. I'm sorry it's you. Not that I I'm don't sorry like you it are doubting just... the information that is in the possession of the U.S. government. No, I... I, what I'm telling you is that this is information that's available to us. We are making it available to you uh, in order uh, for a couple reasons. One is to attempt to deter the Russians from going ahead with this activity. Two, in the event we're not able to do that, in the event the Russians do go ahead with this, to make it clear as day, to lay bare the fact that this has always been an attempt on the part of the Russian Federation to fabricate a pretext. Yeah, but you don't have any, any evidence to back it up other than what you're saying. It's like you're saying, 
we think we, we, we have ev information the Russians may do this, but you won't tell us what the information well, is. That, and then when, when, that, when you're that, asked... That, that is the idea behind when, deterrence, Matt. When, that is the when, idea when behind asked, deterrence. And when it is asked, our hope that the Russians don't go forward with this. And when you're asked is, you say, I just gave it to you. But that, that's not what you you seem not to not understand. You seem not to no, no, understand no, the idea of deterrence. Understand. We are you trying to not deter to the, the idea Russians of... from moving forward with this type of activity. That is why we are making it public today. If the Russians don't go forward with this, that is not uh, ipso facto an indication that they never had plans to do so. Uh, but then it's unprovable. <laughs> I mean, my God, what is the evidence that you have that suggests that, that, that the Russians are even planning this? Matt, you, I mean, I'm not you, saying that they're not. But you just come out and say this and expect us just to, to, to believe it without you showing a shred of evidence that it's actually true. Other than when I ask, or when anyone else asks, what's the information? You said, well, I just gave it to you, which was just you making a statement. Matt, you said yourself, you've been in this business for quite a long time. You know that when we make information, uh, intelligence information public, we do so uh, in, a, in a way that protects sensitive sources and methods. You also know that we do so, we declassify information only when we're confident in that information. Yeah, you if you doubt, if you doubt the, the credibility of the US government, of the British government, uh, of other governments, and want to uh, you know, find uh, solace in information that uh, the solace? Russians are putting out, uh, that is uh, that is for wanna, you to do. I'm not asking what, what the Russian government is putting out. And, and what, John, do you mean, what is it supposed to be? Now, you know, so that's rather extraordinary, uh, Craig. Um, there was a headline over the weekend, in addition to this run by Bloomberg, and the headline, we'll put it up, it, it, you'll just see it, it's on the sidebar of their website, but it said, Russia invades Ukraine. Um, now, they apologised for this and they said, oh, you know, we have a number of scenarios and headlines to reflect that ready to go. And this inadvertently or accidentally got put up on the website, but it wasn't taken down for half an hour. Um, and the Russian um, Kremlin spokesman actually said, look, you know, in the kind of environment we're in today, there's no room for these kind of mistakes because the war beat up's been so strong that any accident could trigger a war. So we're in a, an extremely dangerous climate. Um, the Sydney Morning Herald is running a series of articles and also we'll put up on the screen, um, is Australia ready for war? They've done part one and part two of that. Um, you know, this is something to which Australians have to definitively answer, no, we are not ready for war. Of course, they're asking the question, are we militarily ready for war? Um, but the intervention we're making to diffuse these claims about Russia and about China is really critical to give the, deliver the message to the government that there's no need for war and we certainly do not want it. Um, Peter Dutton um, had an article also headlined, Australia will lose next decade unless it stands up to China. Uh, and this was just prior to the arrival of US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who's in Australia now for a meeting of the Quad, which is the US, UK, Australia and India, one of these um, exclusive blocks uh, that has been around for a while but been re recently revived um, to corner China in the region. Um, uh, Lincoln told The Australian today or yesterday, uh, we're not trying to contain China, we're just standing up for the rules-based order. Um, yes, well, as we said many times, our rules-based order, you know, the rules of other countries don't count, apparently. Um, but I want to tell viewers about an extraordinary intervention that came uh, on the sidelines of the Winter Olympics taking place in China at the moment. And for all of the nonsense in the media about uh, China and the Olympics and so forth, um, this is something that hasn't made the major headlines. Uh, so on the 4th of February, China and Russia, uh, President Putin was there in person to meet with Chinese President Xi, and they issued a joint statement um, as well as signing 15 bilateral agreements on everything from gas to agriculture, various cooperative uh, arrangements. And in the joint statement that they issued, however, and I recommend people to actually read it um, because even press reports of it can't do it justice. You can 
Um, certainly uh, contact us for a copy of the latest Australian alert service, which has an article summarising it, but which also provides the link so people can get the full gist of this um, stunning intervention, which has been described as a, um, a tectonic shift. Because what Russia and China state in there uh, is that, you know, the world has had enough of the Anglo-American geopolitical games. And in fact, they declare that this Anglo-American geopolitical faction is a minority faction on the planet. There's so many small nations, developing nations, even larger nations that have had it to the back teeth with this, with the drive for war. You know, hostilities are the only way to solve anything, apparently, according to this faction. Regime change, ousting even democratically elected leaders, um, which is against their notion of the rules based order anyway, and their notions of democracy. And that's the other thing these nations are sick of, this um, sense that the Anglo-Americans are the only adjudicators of what a democracy is, and they will intervene to impose their version of democracy if you don't like it, um, you know, completely flouting what the notion of democracy is altogether. Uh, the statement goes on to declare that the really crucial factor for the world right now in the economic crisis that we're in and the strategic crisis is cooperation and they call for a truly multipolar even polycentric world and of course with a focus on cooperation around economic development uh, they call for an architecture that will quote respect the rights of people to independently determine the development paths of their countries and the sovereignty and the security and development interests of states to protect the United Nations driven international architecture and the international law based world order. And they're referring back to the post-war agreements, including Franklin Delano Roosevelt's original notion of the United Nations as an association of nations, as a forum for diplomacy. Um, they go on to demand that peace, development and cooperation lie at the core of the modern international system and they say development is a key driver in ensuring the prosperity of nations. And they single out these kinds of exclusive blocks, um, like I mentioned one before being the Quad, but they actually single out AUKUS, the Australia, UK, US agreement that was re recently introduced. So these, this creation of exclusive blocks, um, you know, excluding various other countries in the region, um, is exactly the wrong approach to the kind of cooperation that's required. Um, now, just a couple of the reactions and then I'll let you speak to it, Craig, um, because, of course, as we said in the headline, this is China and Russia have been being driven together in this way, has been set about by what the Anglo-Americans have done. And it's their worst nightmare that this would occur and that other nations would begin to fall in behind China and Russia saying, yeah, well, that's what we want too. Um, so the Telegraph had the headline, Russia and China rise from their knees to challenge US dominance. <laughs> but it said, at a moment of immense international tension, Russia and China are asserting the arrival of a new geopolitical era. From now on, the dominance of the US-led global West will no longer be taken for granted or tolerated. After decades of humiliation, the world's autocratic superpowers have risen from their knees and will now upend the inequitable post-Cold War world order. The Atlantic Council, um, which is a NATO offshoot essentially, said the world's top two authoritarians have teamed up. The US should be on alert. The broad areas that the agreement covers are head spinning, it went on to say. And this week's joint statement underscores a tectonic shift in global relations. Well, that much is true. And I'll just add, um, because this guy is, um, uh, seems to be uh, admired by Peter Dutton, Elbridge Colby, who's an ex-US national security guy under Trump, who helped refashion some of their defence and security doctrines and is having a huge influence on Australia. Peter Dutton's read his book uh, and is promoting it. Um, you know, he basically says we should promote uh, a war between China and Taiwan because that'll help us 
um, help convince the world to pull rank on China. On Sky News on the 6th of February, he called uh, this advancement between China and Russia, these new agreements, an indictment of American statecraft since basic dear political prudence dictates that they should be kept apart. <laughs> mm. So they're well, not it, happy. Yeah, I want to just reiterate what I said in the campaign launch last night. Was we were asked a question uh, about if, we, if, if, given the fact that there's such a dangerous move towards war with China you know, in this country, what would I do as a candidate uh, and I'm a Senate candidate for Victoria. So what would I do as a candidate to address this issue? And I, and I wanted, I made it clear that the issue for us as an organisation, we've always supported the, the, the President Xi Jinping and also President Putin because they support the so sovereignty of their own nations, the right to develop their own nations, and they've rejected the Western idea of there has to be a winner and has to be a lo loser in relations between countries, right? This is the, uh, the, the, the current... Uh, prevailing idea that there always has to be a winner, there always has to be a loser. Therefore, if we can't really uh, deal with China unless, in a sense, we're winning all the time. Now, if you go back into history and you look at some of the predicates of how you solve these issues, you, you've got to look at the Hundred Years War and you have to look at what a guy by the name of Cardinal Mazarin did in solving a Hundred Years of War. Now, we're not in war, but the principle still applies. And that was the principle, the, he, he brought about what was called the Treaty of Westphalia. And the underlying principle for that was the, the, the concept of the advantage of the other. If countries look towards how can we help another country, which is, I, I say in religious terms, could be also considered the Good Samaritan principle, where you put forward the idea of looking at the welfare of another country as well as yourself, what you find is that both countries develop, both countries can prosper, both countries can benefit. That's President Xi Jinping's win-win solution. He understands that. And he's brought that also into the BRICS grouping of countries, which is Brazil, China, India, Russia and South Africa, that have been busily developing themselves through all sorts of different relationships and development projects and cooperation, that you've now got the situation where, yes, the two largest countries involved, Russia and China, are now saying, We've had enough. We've, we've proven, in a sense, that this level of cooperation, the win-win solution works. And there's 120 plus countries that are involved with uh, China in developing themselves. If you go back into the 1970s, if countries wanted to develop themselves, the only place they could get support for that was from the IMF. And the IMF would, you know, would dictate certain conditionalities if they wanted loans or finances to develop themselves. And those conditionalities in themselves became absolutely crippling, right? Because this is the way the Anglo-American financial uh, oligarchy, and I talk about oligarchy because they want to literally rule over these countries. They want to dictate to, to the lessers, you might say, how they're going to exist. This was the only way you could get credit. But over the last 10 years in particular, you've seen China and its internalised development po policies lift China out of, a lot of the uh, Chinese out of poverty, and they've extended the, 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 the ability to provide investment funds to many, many countries around the world. And they've looked at China and said, well, if China's doing that to its own population, maybe we could work with them to help lift our population up as well. That's gathered momentum. China and Russia know what they've been doing. President Putin came into power in 2000 when his country was losing millions of people through the attrition that these neoliberal Western policies had, dom uh, had, had, had foisted upon Russia after the, the collapse of, of the Soviet Union. So he, he changed that. He turned that around. But the intention, as President Putin has said, is by the West is we're not going to allow Ra Russia to develop. That's, he stated that. He said, that's, that's a clear intention here. We're not wearing that. We're acting in our own interests for our own national sovereignty. We're going to collaborate with other countries that understand that principle on a win-win basis, and we're going to move forward. The West has got a big problem here, and I hope they don't do what they've always done and gone to war to solve it. And that's the real danger here, because the West will trigger a war unless there's enough people in the West to, to, to rise up and say, this is a pathetic, stupid and idiotic policy. And our leaders in this country are pushing that agenda because they think that somehow the short-term expediency of pushing a war policy is somehow beneficial for our country. And that's abs it's not, not even a policy, it's pure and utter stupidity. 
Yep, we've been here before. It's the same kind of geopolitical games that got us into World War I and World War II. And um, uh, highlighting this uh, statement by Russia and China doesn't mean that we support everything that Russia and China do and we don't have to, and that's not what China and Russia are asking. In fact, they're saying, let nations define their terms uh, of their future of their nations and their policy. We can't be subservient to some unilateral power coming in to dictate. So that's what we're calling attention to and what people have to give some thought to because otherwise we're sliding down that slippery slope to another world war and this time, um, it's not going to be like World War One or World War Two. We're not going to be fighting in the trenches. We probably won't even get a chance to fight before the button gets pushed. Mm. So um, yeah. find out more. Call in for a copy. If you haven't already, we send you a complimentary one of the alert service. All the stories we've talked about are detailed, uh, you know, in more depth in the latest publication. And you can find out more on our website since we've uh, run out of time for this week. And uh, I do encourage you to uh, go to our campaign pages and have a look at the videos of our candidates, the video from last night and our fighting platform. Don't forget to share the show as widely as possible. Hit the like button so it does the rounds. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Lisa. Maybe a bit of luck you might be back in the studio next week. <laughs> That's the plan. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Uh, so thanks for tuning in and we'll see you in one format or another again next week. Thank you.